Hello, Internet. My name is Camomile. And I'm Fortuna, the Roman goddess of luck. Uh, Cam, have you seen Requiem anywhere? I was looking for him. Uh, he was just here a second ago. but Oh, man. He tried to fix the lottery again, and I just, I'm done with him. Like, I, I tried to, you know, give him some ironic punishment. I gave him a monkey's paw. His first wish was for the paw to have infinite fingers. Uh, and then he, I, like, he wished that all of the consequences... I've been how he's been able to make that many wishes. <laughs> so this, yeah. is, this is explaining a lot. I figured he eventually wished for something that would, you know, destroy him and I would get my revenge. But then his second wish was that for all the consequences of the monkey's paw to affect you instead. I, I'm trying to find some way where this is a wacky misunderstanding and like maybe he thought all the consequences would be really good regardless like he got out of the monkey's paw punishment so I just I figured I would just take care of him in person do you mind if I stick around see if he shows up yeah sure I mean he was just here during the test recording I don't know where he went he'll probably come back Yeah, so, uh, are you familiar with Kingdom Hearts? Yeah, yeah, uh, I am, in fact. Uh, and, uh, you know, as the uh, Roman goddess of luck, I also have a background in the literary criticism. That makes sense. Roman gods and literary criticism are both things that people talk about in college, so. Yeah. <laughs> So I'll be able to fill in for Requiem, you know, just until he shows up and I'm able to smite him. I don't know why you're surprised by this. Oh, if the heart, if the heartless get in through the the doors to darkness, then what happens to the planet? Well, eventually they disappear. What? Dude, you saw this happen. <laughs> to your own planet. <laughs> so as long as we're talking with a uh, not squall, I remember that in a uh, in the memoir Boy Erased, which is about a uh, young man who had to undergo conversion therapy in rural Arkansas. Uh, there's kind of an extended sequence where he and this other boy are playing Final Fantasy VIII, and they're both convinced that Squall is gay for some reason. I don't know if it's just it was they were both gay and they were projecting on this video game character, or it just came to mind having him. Uh, this game probably came out at the same around the same time as Final Fantasy VIII. I guess a little bit after, since Titus shows up. Yeah, this is a couple of years after Final Fantasy VIII. As I recall, like, a pretty big plot point in 8 is, like, his Squall's, like, love interest uh, with Renoa. I think so. Name? I mean, I played that game when I was, like, 9, so I was aware that romance existed, but... There's some discussion in queer theory about uh, reading, making queer interpretations of texts that very much are not, and that is sort of a liberatory experience for LGBT people. Uh, so you can take a character who is within the text straight and just interpret him as being LGBT in some way especially in a culture that is uh, heteronormative like ours is on a completely unrelated note uh, do you think Squall <laughs> and Riku are going to date? <laughs> I mean hopefully not since uh Sora is in love with both of them. He's in love with one of them, isn't he? Like, canonically? One of Squall and Riku? Yes. Uh, I mean... There are sections of the fandom that will argue for Riku. <laughs> Particularly in Kingdom Hearts 2, they have, uh, they have some scenes together. Oh boy. 
uh, I look forward to that let's play. I kind yeah. of like Squall's design in this better than in Final Fantasy VIII. I don't know if it's just the graphics have improved. Yeah, I mean, his jacket doesn't have the fur anymore, which I never liked the fur. I think it might just be the fur. Yeah. The Gunblade remains stupid as ever. I mean, I still love the Gunblade. Just because, like, you're not wrong, but... <laughs> Like, well, that that's gets the back kind of... to what we. Right. That gets back to what we talked about last time with uh, the note song camp. Uh, Which I what did you think of that. Uh, so about half a paragraph in, I was like, "Oh right, this is why I hate academia." <laughs> that's fair. It was very dense. Um, I'm in the wrong place, aren't I? But did it? But yeah, make uh, sense? it did. I, mean, I think I got the gist, and it is, it was literal notes, and like you know, somewhere early on they had some excuse of like you know, uh, I forget the exact phrasing of it. I mean, I've got the game up, so I can't go digging through it for quotes. Otherwise, I absolutely would. But uh, <laughs> you know, early on they like, made some excuse for why they weren't going to write a proper essay with like you know a conclusion and a point, and they were instead just going to meander for a while thinking about like you know just just sort of free associating their thoughts on camp and I just I, I am not buying that excuse I think they just didn't want to write a proper essay which uh like there was definitely there was nothing in there that like I disagreed with or didn't think with like all of it was like yes this is this is describing what I love about Final Fantasy, more or less, and it did keep making reference to stuff from the 60s, because it was written in 1964. So, I, I did kind of have to... Uh, try and glean from context what they were talking about with a lot of their examples. And, you know, I, I, you know, I could look stuff up on Google, but that's not the same as actually watching a, or reading a, a thing. Mainly watching, they were mostly movies. But, yeah. Uh, for the most part, my takeaway was just, this is real dense and also from the 60s. <laughs> and I, I don't get any of its references. Yeah, that is fair. Which... Uh... A lot of, like, literary academia writing can be kind of overly dense. Uh... But you get, like... Uh... And I can actually can pull up notes on camp, and I'm going to for this conversation. You get the whole thing where, like, it is it, something is campy if it's sincere, but it's also performed in a way that makes it impossible to, to take sincerely. Right. Uh, which is kind of funny with uh, the uh, Schumacher Batman movies, which are trying to be camp, which one of Sontag's points is that. Something cannot be campy on purpose. Camp emerges yeah. uh, naturally. But the funny thing about Batman is it tries to be camp, it fails, and thus it can be camp. Because <laughs> it failed so badly at being camp, it becomes camp. It's the failure of Schumacher's uh, Batmans to be sincerely camp that allows them to actually be camp. Well, it's funny. Like, I think uh, I can never... Who was the person who wrote this thing? Because Susan Sontag. Susan Sontag. So I think she is wrong about that things cannot intentionally be camp. Uh, I think it is possible to say, like, you know, I know this is dumb and I'm playing it straight anyway. That is a, you know, the uh, person who had the first read notes on camp, that was also his contention. Uh, he pointed to John Waters' movies as being intentionally camp uh, and succeeding. It's so long as you have a sincere love for the dumb thing you are doing, uh, I think you can make it camp. Is this, do I have to? 
Okay, no. I'm trying to remember the exact order of stuff I have to do in order to get this. When I was a kid, I looked this up on GameFAQs. Uh, <laughs> there's a very convoluted... That's kind of the of, uh, problem with these uh, JRPGs. You'll sometimes have something you have to do that's excessively complicated and maybe wasn't translated well in a game that is meant for, like, 13-year-olds. Right. I mean, fortunately, we invented the internet. I don't know how people got by in the 80s. Yeah. Alright, we're gonna try and clean out the gizmo shop this time. Yeah. Those are the interesting, uh... What Sontag also notes, the connection with gay male culture. And especially since she was writing... 64, I think that was pre-Stonewall. Let me check really quick. Yeah, she's writing like five years before Stonewall. Uh, talking about the connection to gay male culture with uh, campiness. Yeah, I remember, you know, because you know, I don't have nearly enough knowledge of the history to, uh, to know, but it's like, in an academic setting, what was, what was the connotation of associating something with gay male culture at the time? Like, like Sontag is very left wing. Uh... Right, like I definitely, Sontag definitely came across as. Uh, you know, okay with gay. Um, which I didn't want to make that rhyme, but I couldn't figure out how else to phrase it. <laughs> uh, but, like, I, you know, I kind of wondered, it's like, would other academics have parsed that as, combina as condemnation? Saying that it was associated with gay male culture? I don't because know, actually. It was actually. 1964, so I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't know. Like, it's not like there had been no gay activism before Stonewall, like, you get the Mattachine Society and the Daughters of Billis, and you do get stuff, and, like, it's academia, and it's literary criticism, like, it's always been a more left-leaning field, but I actually, I really don't know, like, at all, honestly. Like, even within, uh, the left, uh, at the time, it wasn't necessarily universally agreed that, uh, gay culture was something in need of liberation, so. I do find that very odd, just because, I mean, you know, surely things were not so open that, you know, you could hold hands with your boyfriend in public, even on a college campus. Well, and definitely not that, like, but... Which, I mean, so... It does make me wonder, is, that, you know, is this just one of those things where it's sort of, once you have had something explained to you, you project it onto your past self as having always been obvious? Because that definitely happens a lot. Uh, well, it's, also, it's not like that there was no gay culture or gay male culture at all. Like, because you see with gay coding, like, it's... The, probably the high, height of gay coding, uh, of actual gay coding, is in the 50s and the 60s. You'll see all sorts of, like, winking references to gay culture. Like, uh, there is infamously a uh, Western movie that uses the word gunsel, which and doesn't really explain what it means. And in gay culture, it just meant it was uh, the submissive partner in sex. But because they don't explain what it means within the context of the movie, in Westerns, it just turns into a young gunslinger. So you do see all sorts of like, especially in the art, you see all sorts of all sorts of winking references to gay culture that aren't explicitly explained. Uh, like even a, you even think you can even think further back to that in a lot of Oscar Wilde's work, you see all sorts of references to gay culture and gay events. Uh, in a, uh, the importance of being earnest, uh, he references a uh, famous male brothel in Victorian London. And then uh, the picture of Dorian Gray, it's very obvious, like he never spells out what is going on, but it's very obvious that some of the men that Dorian interacts with that he's hooking up with, like it's it's very, 
you don't have to do a lot to figure out what is going on. It doesn't spell it out in any way, but like it's very obvious. Uh, right. And then there was uh, actually a scandal. I'm gonna look this up really quick. There was a scandal involving a male prostitute in Victorian London. Uh, the Cleveland Street scandal. So, like, people where, which was where some prominent uh, men in upper crust British society got accused of being regulars at a male brothel in London. Uh, and, like, so people were aware of this stuff going on, and there was a subculture that existed, at least, you know, back into the Victorian times. Uh, I find it very like, strange uh, that people would not think that, and people just thought this was that this was fine. Like you know, it was working. Like I can, I I, I can understand people saying it's like, well, you know, gay people are able to get in touch with each other, and I guess that's good enough. Uh, but I think also you got to remember that there's been back and forth on like progression. Right. Of like, because like in the 1920s, that's when we sort of we were moving pretty quickly towards being like progressive on gay uh, rights. Like, you get uh, the uh, Sex Institute in uh -oh. Berlin that uh, is sort of a pioneer on gay and trans rights, and uh, the head doctor would give out cards to trans uh, patients, uh, allowing them to legally transition in public. And you also have like popular songs referencing the fact that everybody's gay now. There's a song called uh, from the 1920s called Let's All Be Fairies, talking about how it used to be there were just two fairies, and now it seems that everybody's a fairy. <laughs> uh, like, but then like you get into the 30s and 40s and there's a backlash and things go very rapidly in the other direction across the Western world. So it could just be like you, you hit a time and like people just think things are just gonna keep moving forward and then they don't. Right. That's definitely the, the assumption of the inevitability of progress in whatever direction it's currently moving is comes up all the time in so many different ways. I really wish you could side with the Heartless. Just start destroying worlds for them because they're so cute. <laughs> Get anything that adorable be evil. I'm kind of reminded of the uh, the definition of antihero, which is a villain who's hot. <laughs> when you can't see their health bars, or can you? Uh, yeah, no, I have that ability now. Oh, so. Yeah. I just figured if you can't see your health bar, like, you can't target one you've been targeting, so it makes it harder to, uh, eliminate. Yeah, no, I am focusing fire on one of them, but, like, they keep getting in each other's way, and, uh, after they get sufficiently damaged, they switch to a second, much harder moveset, which oh. is still pretty easy to deal with in isolation, but, uh, the problem is when a whole bunch of them start using it, because Goofy doesn't know how to focus fire. Right. Neither does Donald, but Donald spends most of his time unconscious, so it doesn't matter. So when you get to the level where you have to choose to save one of them and the other one's going to die, you're definitely choosing Donald. I mean, not Donald, uh, Goofy. Yeah, okay, these crates are not taking damage. There is a little red trinity behind there, and there is the bell. But it is just blocked off inexplicably, so there is something I need to do to make those crates go away, I have no idea what it is. So, why don't we use the power of the internet? I mean, I don't think either of us are skilled enough to uh, access that power, are we? 
we're out of other options, so we're gonna have to do something desperate. Also, aren't you a god? No, wait, you should be able to. Yeah, I mean, that's- that's- Okay, here's what- here's what the top voted answer is. You need to seal the keyhole and beat the bosses in Deep Jungle and Wonderland, which you did. Talk what? to Sid at the accessory shop and deliver the book to Merlin, then talk to Sid again. Okay, so I have to go talk to Sid again. That- <sighs> People took a look at Sora and were like, Hey, you look like a main character. I've got a bunch of uh, chores I need done. I mean, if they would just tell me what chores they need done, and then I could go do them, this would have gone a lot faster. <laughs> the problem is that I have to hunt down which people need their chores done before the main plot will move its mystery crates out of the way so I can advance it. This whole episode is going to be just uh, wandering around Traverse Town, trying to find out how to get those indestructible crates to move. <laughs> Riveting, I'm sure. And you already talked to Leon, and there's not another way to talk to Leon. Slash Squall. I guess I'll go and talk to Squall again. Maybe I just have to talk to him twice. That would be so dumb. I'm just grating so hard against my instincts to run past these guys instead of killing them all. Oh my god, that was it, wasn't it? I have to talk to Leon twice. Oh my god. When I was little, I would always feel bad for using strategy guides, but it's stuff like this where it's like, you, there's no way you would figure this out necessarily. Like, having the strategy guide, it just makes it significantly less frustrating. It's not yeah. really cheating. It's just like, this was a part of the game that was poorly marked out. So you would have no right. idea what necessarily you had to do without being told explicitly by a strategy guide. I remember like being like 10, 11 and playing a JRPG and getting to a point where I had no idea what to do because I'm 10 or 11 and it's not actually clearly indicated what you have to do to move the story forward. Yeah, it's not like it's some puzzle, right? It's just... Something that is clearly expl unclearly explained. Right. Like, it's just like you, have to talk to, you have to talk to one character twice in a row is a particularly bad example of like, you know, I talk to Leon and I think, okay... I talked to Leon, I just got a little, you know, pseudo cutscene with, like, special camera angles and stuff. Clearly he was a part of it, you know, and I have done his little part of the quest, and now I need to go talk, you know, I need to trigger what, at least one other thing before going back and talking to him again. Surely, right? But There was, there was <sighs> some JRPG that I played years back when I was a kid, and it had something... To tr keep the plot, the quest moving forward, you had to talk to this police ca officer character three times in a row. Like, you would start the conversation and end the conversation. You had to do that two more times. But nowhere else in the game does a character do that. Everywhere else, like, they just complete their conversation in the one uh, activation. And they'll just repeat it if you try to activate them again. And I only figured out that I had to talk to activate the conversation again by looking it up online or something. Like, there was nothing indicating that I needed to hit the X button by him again. I did not realize that Greece circa, what, 800 BC-ish, whenever you were a kid, had uh, this level of technology. Yeah, I mean, well, we're we're demi we're deities. We've, we've been holding on to the video game stuff for, you know, a while, seeing when you mortals would be ready for it. Like, I was ready for you guys to have it, like, from the get-go. Like, anything to get a little more chance into your life. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. You know, and Hephaestus, he just likes the cool toys, but Athena was like, maybe this is a bad idea when, uh, you know, they don't have electricity or they don't understand how circuits work. She's always such a buzzkill. She is. You know, with all her don't put your hand on the stove this and <laughs> don't fly too close to the sun that. Don't give that mortal that monkey paw. Finally. Okay.
this red mark better do something amazing. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't. Oh my god. That's always the best. Some super complicated RPG quest, super difficult, and you get like some completely worthless reward. Which, I mean, it's necessary to progress the story, so I guess the reward is the second half of the game. I must fight the instinct to kill everything that crosses my path. That is like especially frustrating because this is something that should clearly be a side quest. Yeah, I mean, Kingdom Hearts one at the very least did not like side quests, um, except for collectibles. Collectibles. Thank God, we're never required in any amount to advance. But. Yeah, and I guess, uh. Most of the stuff with the, the Winnie the Pooh storybook that we're about to get into here were side quests, but the intro for some reason is not. So yeah, now I can summon Simba. Uh, this will never be useful. <laughs> I mean, I feel like I'm just a regular lion. It's not that great when you've got, like, magic and a keyblade. <laughs> Wait, so we don't go to the Lion King world? No, that is in Kingdom Hearts 2. But the Lion King world was destroyed. Uh, yeah, but uh, then you fix it. Oh. It's the plot at the end of Kingdom Hearts 1 you restore all the worlds that were destroyed by darkness. Like, you know, that's, oh, okay. that's the story. I was worried that I had found a continuity error in this otherwise just so tightly plotted story. There you are. What's going oh, on? hey, it's Riku. Yep. So I have a game theory. Hey, hey, cut it out. I think that Riku, our uh, childhood rival who was very blasé about uh, using the power of the darkness, this is going to sound crazy. You're going to be like, Fortuna, He's there's no way this could happen. Isn't she with you? <laughs> that was my second theory. <laughs> my first theory, my first game theory is he's going to turn evil. Like, I know that sounds crazy. Like, how could that ever happen? But I think he's going to turn evil at some point. Don't worry. I mean, I have to assume you used your god powers to figure that one out, because <laughs> it was an absolutely shocking twist. Like, who would see that coming? Sora, uh, what did you... I've been looking for you, and Kyrie too, with their help. Sora's facial animations are a little uncanny. <laughs> it's a problem with King. It's actually uh, in the 1.5 final mix, they fixed this. They gave the non cutscene animations a lot more range. Which is good because a lot of them are like these little half cutscenes like this. It's the very uncanny valley. So this is called a Keyblade? Huh? Hey, give it back. I mean, didn't we establish that he literally cannot steal it? With us, right? We've got this awesome rocket. Wait till you see it. <laughs> if anybody's gonna steal it, it's gonna be uh, Leon, who is a cool seventeen-year-old. <laughs> like, probably if he asked Sora, Sora would definitely just give it to him. When you're 14 slash 12 and a 17 year old asks you for something, you're just going to give it to him. Oh well. At least he's okay. And who knows? Maybe we'll run into Kyrie soon, too. So, Final Mix added a couple of extra cutscenes, but they apparently couldn't, uh, uh, Final Mix 
by the way, there are a million versions of Kingdom Hearts 1, but Final Mix and 1.5 are basically the same thing. Um, Wait, I thought 1.5 was the Final Mix, but they're two different things? No, yeah, there was Kingdom Hearts, there was the Final Mix, uh, and then there was 1.5, which included the Final Mix update, and I think some additional rebalancing. Oh my god. Yeah, the Final Mix was originally Japanese only, and it included a bunch of content that had originally been exclusive to the North American version. <laughs> because the Japanese and North American versions of Kingdom Hearts 1, the original release, are actually meaningfully different, not just uh, translations. There is content in the North American version the Japanese version did not get. So yeah, it's, it's a whole mess. But in the final mix version, which is basically the 1.5 version, just don't even worry about it. Uh, and you know, I, I know all this because at one point I decided, you know what, I should get caught up on Kingdom Hearts. And I did not realize what kind of project I was getting myself into. <laughs> but there is an, uh, there are additional cutscenes about Riku, but they couldn't get, like, the voice actor back, I guess, because none of them are voiced, so he just, like, wanders around in places, like, you know, he'll, he'll, there's a world that he lands in called Hollow Bastion, which is, like, you know, the spooky evil world, and he just kind of wanders around there for a couple of seconds, and... Yeah, that's that's just So now Riku is in Hollow Bastion, and if you have already played this video game, that means something to you. Oh my god, he got healed, didn't he? Alright, you know what? Not dealing with this BS again. Why am I self-censoring? <laughs> yeah, I cleared out those Heartless once. To the extent yeah. that fight was potentially interesting. Oh, finally. Sorry. Yes. Now, I am going to have to clean out these Heartless because I can't activate the Trinity Mark while I'm in combat, so... Okay, I've really got to start using the quick magic menu. I've got too many spells to use the main menu, which may as well not exist. Oblivion had a good uh, quick magic thing with the uh, D-pad. They got rid of it for Skyrim. I've never played it on console, so I would not know. Skyrim. I did, Skyrim had, like, the worst magic system of any Elder Scrolls game. All the magic spells are useless. Heal. Like, I guess they were trying to fix this thing with uh, spells being so broken in Oblivion, but they just made it completely useless and unfun. Yeah. Okay, so there's three bell symbols, which means we have to ring the bell three times. And also cool symbols appear on the fountain every time you ring. But then if you go down to look at them, you have to fight your way all the way back up. So definitely don't. <laughs> It's a keyhole. Yes. And with editing, we should be wrapping up this visit to Traverse Town in just about 40, 45 minutes, so... <laughs> oh, hey, it's that thing again. Yep. 
Not even pallet swapped. That's a little disappointing. Yeah, no, it does have twice as much HP, though. Ah. I think you took it down significantly faster than the first time. Oh, I guess not. Oh, hey. That's right. <laughs> See, I wanted to say something when you were making fun of it for being a total rerun, but uh, it's like I'll just, I'll just hang on to it for thirty seconds while it uh, does its little switch. But yeah, it's a fake ad. Now it's even more adorable. Which is the main increase in difficulty, you know, it's just hard to beat up on this thing. I assume you just have to beat it one more time before it joins the party. Uh, and it, like it eats uh, Daffy and replaces them. <laughs> Daffy. Donald? They're basically yeah. the same. I mean, I, just, I love that you mix them up because... In fair, Daffy would be a way more interesting character for this. <laughs> Man, I want a Kingdom Hearts. I want a Kingdom Hearts where your companions are Bugs and Daffy. That would be so good. They're just making sarcastic comments about all the Disney worlds you're visiting. Right? Did you see the comic of, uh... Bugs Bunny defeating Thanos by getting him to take off the power glove? I did not. Yes. I'll probably, if you uh, drop it in our Discord chat, though, I can edit it in and post so the audience can see it. I, I will do that. Like, in Who Framed Roger Badgett, there were, like, pretty tense negotiations about screen time between Mickey Mouse and uh, Bugs Bunny. Oh, really? Yeah. Like, it's the only time they've appeared on screen together. I'm really curious. In 2024, the that's the current Mickey year. The current Steamboy Willie year. I'm really curious how that's going to go. Because, like, there is a lot of attention on that issue now that there wasn't the last time they updated it back in, like, the 90s. Like, like I would not be surprised if, you know, Disney just said, we are a mega corporation, fuck you, and made it happen anyway. But, honestly, it's like, at this point, if they would just, like, like, just let them have Mickey eternally if they would just let the rest of the public domain go back to normal. Right. Like, and honestly. I'm, I'm even sympathetic to the idea that certain characters can become deeply associated with a brand. Yeah. To the point where, you know, you don't want to let other people have them because that would let them imitate not just, you know, your story as in a public domain kind of way, but, like, pretend to be you. Uh, which is, you know, so basically what I'm getting at here is that you should be able to trademark characters. Which I think you can, but... That kind of raises the question for why Disney isn't doing that. Just let them have Mickey eternally so they'll stop destroying the rest of the public domain. Right. I mean, the problem is that now they own the copyright to so much valuable IP that they have an incentive to protect all of it. Yeah. You know, if we had made a Mickey exception back in, like, the 90s, then they probably would have taken it and been satisfied, but... Now they own Star Wars and the Marvel Universe and the Muppets and probably some other stuff I'm forgetting. Right, fun fact. Um, Shut Up and Sit Down did a review of... I forget the board game. Um, the one about being hunted by an alien monster on a spaceship. And they had a gag where... That's right. Sid is in the house now. Uh, they had a gag where 
they spent like the first five minutes of the review talking about how they were reviewing Alien, the board game. Uh, and they had a really good sticker on the box, too, so it looked like it was the actual Alien logo was on there. <laughs> and then halfway through, uh, the Quinns, one of the hosts of the show, comes in. He says, wait, stop, stop, stop. You can't... We can't review uh, an Alien product. We're going to get sued by Disney. And he's like, wait, does, does Disney own the Alien brand? He's like, of course they do. It's a film. <laughs> The hilarious thing is, though, Disney does in fact own the Alien brand. Oh they my god. They actually do have that IP. Like, of all things. In Cloud Atlas, uh, the in the future, they just call uh, movies Disney's. It's a Lana Wachowski movie. Based off of a book. So I wonder how old Squall is. Because apparently his world fell nine years ago. So is that supposed to be when he was about Final Fantasy Seven age or Final Fantasy Eight age rather? Because if so, that would make him twenty six now. <laughs> you see, it's just as I told you. Oh my gosh, did Riku fall into the darkness? My game theory was correct. <laughs> Man, thank goodness I have, like, divine uh, omn omnipresence. Like, I'm able to f just know stuff, because otherwise I never would have guessed that. I mean, he hasn't turned evil necessarily. He's just friends with Maleficent is all. That's true. I mean, I'm Frances Maleficent. She's she is real. <laughs> okay, we now have the fast travel. Hooray! 